I like hearing you, Brother Aziz. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who came to us in the person of Master Fard Muhammad, the great expected Mahdi of the Muslims and Masi of the Christians. He came with two hats to give to two servants that he would make to fit the description of Mahdi on one side and Masi or Messiah on the other side. I thank Allah for his coming. I thank him for fitting the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with the hat of Mahdi now in a position of power to fulfill what is expected of El Mahdi to set down every tyrant to set justice in the earth to kill the swine and break the cross. Killing the swine is not just killing hogs. It's killing the appetite in the people for filth and indecency. The other hat was for the Messiah because the Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims are together at the end of the present world. I tried on my hat. It fit quite well. I greet all of you with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. Am I seeing things? Or is this place filled from front all the way to the wall in the back? Pardon me, sir. What did you say? Three other holding hands. My national assistant says there's three other holding rooms for the overflow. Are they overflowing, sir? Yes, sir. And your cup. Very good. You cannot imagine how your presence makes me feel. Forty-two years ago, the world thought that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was dead. When I came to understand that he really was alive, 
and the enemy had been deceived thinking that he killed that great Jesus. He was made to appear as such as the Quran teaches but Allah raised him to himself. So in 1981, at our first Savior's Day, to a small crowd of about, not even 4,000 at the time, after working underground for three years, the nation of Islam popped up again. And I declared at our first Savior's Day that Elijah Muhammad is alive and now in power. I suffered the loss of a lot of friendship when I made that statement. Some of my brothers that helped me while we were in the dark, growing underground, they said, Farrakhan, you know Elijah Muhammad is dead. Why would you say? such a thing. But I made a declaration that took a lot of courage to state my belief. You say, but there was a death certificate. Yeah, you make them all the time. I offered the family to exhume the body. And I said, if you can prove that that body is Elijah Muhammad, I will stop teaching. Well, I sounded to many like a crazy man. <laughs> but 39 Savior's Days after, here we are, all over the world. <laughs> And the sad thing about this, they tried to bury my teacher, not only in a grave, but destroy his works to cut the nation of Islam off as it is written in the Psalms that the name of Israel may no longer be remembered or the name of the nation would no longer be remembered in us. It was a conspiracy between the federal government and the United States of America, the hypocrites from among us, and members of the Arab Muslim world. So in the second edition of the final call, I wrote the whole paper and it was called the crucifixion. 
of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. They never wanted Elijah to come back to you. No Negro or white man produced the fruit of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad given to us by Master Fard Muhammad. So we had to grow from nothing to bring back the name and the teachings of the greatest black man to ever walk among us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And because many of his old followers were happy that his name was buried, happy that his work was destroyed. But I love my teacher. I love the truth that he taught. I love the people that he was missioned to raise from a dead level and resurrect us into the most highly civilized people that the world has ever seen. And we have done all of this without carrying as much as a pen knife in our pocket. Killing nobody unless you needed it by attacking us. So in the 39th Savior's Day, I thank Allah so very, very much that the help of so many that came forth brought the nation back. We're in, I, I don't know, is it 135 cities? How many cities are we in, sir? 131 cities. We're in the Caribbean in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Barbados, in Antigua, in Cuba. We're in Africa. We're in the United Kingdom. And we're even in the Isles of the Pacific. Elijah Muhammad lives! And there is no God but Allah. And Elijah Muhammad is his messenger Messiah, now the exalted Christ. All right. Thank you, brother. Oh, I see. Put it there. Well, just hold it then. Right, we got you, Father. I know you got me. I got you, too. Brothers and, brothers and sisters, to see the nation come back, it's a miracle. Because we have been opposed by the most powerful government on the earth. And don't forget her little brother, Israel
but here we are. So I want to, before I even get into my subject, I want to say some thank yous. Thank you to my wife. Mother could be. Thank you to my wives and their children. Thank you to my children and my families. Thank you to all. I don't care how small your contribution has been. I thank you from the depth of my heart. Because as Marvin Sapp said, We couldn't have done it without you. So we're better. We're stronger. We are wiser. Because God has been our shepherd. I want to thank Minister Troy, Muhammad, thank the staff of Mosque Number One Detroit, thank the staff of Mosque Number Two, Mosque Mariam in Chicago. for aiding us in Detroit to produce this marvelous, this marvelous crowd. And I, I, I'm so touched because I know what you're saying in your hearts. You're saying, thank you, Farrakhan, for bringing back the honorable Elijah Muhammad and his mighty work, the FOI, the MGT, the Vanguard, the soldiers. I am so happy. Now you can see the reward of patience. Now you can see the reward of suffering and sacrifice. I thank my family for they suffered right along with me They had to walk the streets and go to school and listen to people say, your father, your brother, your uncle is an anti-Semite. He's a hater. This is not the work of hate. This is a demonstration of the awesome power of love. We're in love with you. We're in love with our people. I am so grateful for your presence here today and I pray that whatever Allah allows me to say 
that it will enlighten the hearts and minds of the listener. It will give you something that will help in the transformation of your lives. I want to thank my council that guides and governs the nation of Islam. In the 42nd surah of the Quran, which is called the Council, it says the nation and these are they who govern their affairs by counsel. Why counsel? See, power destroys those who are not made to handle it. Power in organizations that are run by personalities that are dictatorial, whether that be church, whether that be organization, not any of you know enough to dictate that which brings about true freedom, justice, and equality to the people that you serve. You don't know enough. You're not wise enough. And most of you are not strong enough to build something that the enemy does not want. So governing by counsel fulfills the scripture. See, Jesus never appointed a dictator after himself. He said, where there are two or three of you gathered together in my name, there I am also in the midst of you. Now you can't gather in the name of Christ and come up with that which is against what Christ taught, lived, and died for. This is no dictatorship. I was put in this position. I didn't steal from nobody. I started with nothing. No followers, no money. I used to look at the picture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when I thought he was dead. And I said, dear apostle, I was faithful to you for 20 years. I work night and day. I have nothing. You didn't leave me nothing? You know how stupid children get when somebody dies and they didn't see the, their name on the will uh, with some big gift. So I was acting very immature. And then one day I looked at his picture and said, thank you. You gave me everything.
you gave me the word <clears throat> and God gave me the faith and the courage and the strength. That's what you're looking at. So I accept your thanks. And I pray that you will protect what so many of us suffered, bled, and died to bring this about. The brothers in every prison in the United States of America, they're so afraid, they're now banning any word from Louis Farrakhan. And some of you know I am a good man. Some of you know when you have a relationship with this man, you don't have a relationship with a cheat, a liar, a man who promises what he doesn't try to fulfill. You don't have that kind of man. This is the house that love built. That's right. I never complained on my suffering. You know what it's like to wake up in the morning and every day on the news, somebody is cussing you, condemning you. I'm not talking about my silly little brothers who are envious or jealous. I don't pay you no attention. But I'm talking about the government of America. I'm talking about the FBI. I'm talking about the CIA. I'm talking about the Department of Defense. I'm talking about all the government agencies that have worked against us. But here we are. In 1985, four years after I declared that my leader and teacher, Elijah Muhammad, was indeed alive, I caught hell. I lost followers. I lost friends. That man crazy. Now, you're going to have to reason with what I say. Because you can't make me out a liar. You may not believe. That's not my fault. That's your stupidity and your ignorance and your hatred of a black man that loved another black man so much that I would offer my life to bring that man back and his teaching. There is no Christian pastor that preaches Jesus, that will lay down their life for him, except a few. Most of us are in it for the business. And that's why Jesus said, all that came before me were thieves and robbers. But I, he said, am the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If you're not willing to die for this people, get the hell out from in front of them. Get out from in front of them. If you are not willing to face the lion in the thicket and the wolf that wants to eat the sheep, get out from in front of this people. I'm born to die for this. And can't no punk walk with me. So if you want to be depunctified, go ahead, go ahead. Depunctified, <laughs> join the FOI, join the MDT, join the nation of Islam, and take a dose of what got Farrakhan lucky in. Almost broke my chest, man. <laughs> so, see, you don't know my mission. I'm not just some preacher, though I know how to preach. Some of my Baptist friends. They heard me speak at my spiritual daddy's home going. The Reverend Dr. Clay Evans. I call him dad. He's about six years older than me. He called me his son. He's one of the great, great Christian pastors taking a Muslim as his son. Some of you Negroes, you don't mind meeting the minister in the dark like them $2 prostitutes that you hang out with. <laughs> but I'm not mad at you. But I hate it that you can meet me in the dark and say nice things about me because you don't know nothing else to say. Can I tell you something? See, it takes a sinless man to be the atonement price for the redemption of our people. Are you telling us that you're sinless? You're damn right I am. Are you telling us that you have never committed sin? No, I would be a liar then. Well, how are you sinless? See, when you do the work that I do, when you tell the truth like I have, when you suffer from the enemy like I have, then God declares me sinless and wipes away all 
of my sin. Did I greet you yet this morning? I mean to tell you, assalamu alaikum. That was the preamble to my constitution. I have a lot to say, and uh, I really don't want to be here all day. But as I was watching the impeachment trial of President Trump, I was looking at America, not at her finest hour, but I watched the high level of chicanery. The high level of deceit. I watched brilliant lawyers on two sides of one simple question. None willing to agree with the truth. But using their skillful knowledge of the law to outsmart this one or that one to cover the Senate. And our president that was impeached by two articles of impeachment. And the Senate was not willing to say he did that. And then Mr. Dershowitz came forward and said, uh, yes, he may have done that. But it doesn't rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors so you should not impeach him. And he gave a cover to the cowardice of the Senate. And I watched the Bible being fulfilled. If Satan cast out Satan, how then can his kingdom stand? You, my poor, pitiful brothers and sisters, you are opting to be a part of that that is unraveling right in front of your eyes. You see the country cascading downward. You see the moral fiber of America getting into the gutter. Who wants a membership in a house, in a house of whores? Did I say something wrong? Bought and paid for leaders? Nobody can stand up if the enemy says, you don't stand up for that. Satan is having a field day with America. And evil has been made fair seeming.
So as I was watching this, the subject for my lecture today, which is full of good news and warning, the unraveling of a great nation. The unraveling of a great nation. When you unravel something, you undo twisted, knitted, or woven threads. You investigate and solve or explain something complicated or puzzling. The condition of America is puzzling. The world is looking at a country going to hell. The world is looking at a president who wants to be king. When the Constitution and the Founding Fathers were trying to run away from what they suffered in Europe under the kings. So, there's a verse in the Quran that I was thinking of. It's in the 16th surah, the 92nd verse, and it said, be not like her who unravels her yarn, disintegrating it into pieces after she has spun it strongly. Her here is not talking about a woman as such, but if you see somebody knitting something with a design and they leave it not secured one stitch and then the same woman who stitched it strongly starts pulling on the yarn that she has knitted until it comes to pieces. That's what's happening to America as we speak. America was not built on a firm foundation. Although the weaving was done strongly, the nation called America was doomed from its inception. How do you build a nation? Killing the native people. How do you build a nation? Bringing a whole people out of Africa to America to be made slaves. This is your foundation. So for them to lie to you and make you think that America is a land of promise for you and you believe it, No wonder Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You've been bamboozled. You've been hoodwinked. As Brother Malcolm say, you've been took, you've been had.
Are you quoting Brother Malcolm Farrakhan? Why not? He was my first great teacher. He taught me much. And one of the lessons that he taught me was how to love the leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when he found fault with his teacher, I could no longer accept his tutelage. We all were in the same class. He was a great student in the class. I was just coming up in the class. He shook the world. Being with Elijah Muhammad for 12 years. Well, some of you have been in high, high school and you graduated from the 12th grade. How wonderful. But you ain't shook nothing. Malcolm was with Elijah Muhammad for 12 years and shook the world. My question to you is, what did he learn? After 12 years of studying under a man who finished the third grade and was entering the fourth when his education stopped. How could Elijah Muhammad make a man to shake the world? All you Negroes that have matriculated from some of the finer institutions of America and can't shake the neighborhood that you live in. Brother Malcolm, after 12 years, shook the world. Only went to the eighth grade of school. What is it about this man, Elijah? <laughs> Oh, I love to talk about that man. <laughs> what is it about him that his students in every city where there was a temple rose to the top of leadership in that city? Malcolm's journey with Elijah Muhammad was aborted. You know when you're pregnant and there's an abortion, the growth and development stops at the time of the abortion and that which was evolving now starts degenerating. Muhammad Ali, he shook the world. Student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You got a problem with that? I watched my brother defeat intelligent people that thought he was a dummy. And when they used the word that he didn't understand, he stopped. What that mean? And when he explained it, Muhammad said, yeah, I'm that, I, 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 I am that. He shocked the world. 
as a student of Elijah Muhammad for 12 years or so. They tried to abort me from my class, but I stayed with my teacher. And before he left us, listen to how he described Farrakhan. He said, this is a man that this world can't bother. I mean, just think about that. This is a man, talking about me, that this world cannot bother. Now, you know they hate me. Here I stand. My brow is not furrowed. In fact, all the hell that they and their minions and the hypocrites give me, I sleep well. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. So from being in the class, this Savior's Day, I joined the class 65 years ago. And if you get acquainted with me, you'll see that Elijah Muhammad made me a master. A master. The enemy is upset with the fact that the nation of Islam is here and we continue to make progress in spite of the opposition. So we are living in the time of the unraveling of this great nation. Now, this subject matter has a double meaning. Because we're a great nation, too. When I was in Iran, I ask the question, based on the Quranic verse, Allah says, you are the best nation raised among men. You enjoin good and you forbid evil. That's the description of the best nation. I was in Iran, I said, are you that nation? Saudi Arabia, are you that nation? What nation do you know that forbids evil? 
and in decency and enjoins good and has not won through violence and the murder of anyone. What nation? You're looking at it. This is the best nation. So while I'm talking about how America is unraveling, I want you to focus on our nation because the enemy wants to unravel what you see here today that it won't be here. Yeah. But I tell you, government of America, you can do all you want to do. Bring your guns. We don't have none. I'm anxious to show you the two that back me. I want to show you a real savior. Come on, America. We can't stop you. You don't like us. We don't have nothing to fight you with but our hands and our feet. Oh, we could go to the little gun shop. We got to go to you because you're the gun maker. The hell do we look like resting on your stupid weapon system? I got a weapon with me. And it ain't no pop gun. I'm not bragging or boasting. We accepted this to die on it and die for it because we are fighting for Islam. And we will surely win. With our Savior, Allah, the universal King. We hold these truths, the founder's right, to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and security. Do you have life, liberty? What is the pursuit of happiness? You mean you don't have it? No, you don't. And if you think having a nice car and a few dollars in the bank 
is the pursuit of happiness, you're sick. Having the pursuit of happiness is engaging in the business of life itself. Having the pursuit of happiness means that you create the means of self-sufficiency. Having the pursuit of happiness, meaning that whatever you want to do in life of good, the avenue is open for you in this nation that you can pursue your desires. How many of you have fulfilled your desires? Desires that will make you happy. Happy because you're productive. Happy because you can look and see what the brilliance of your mind and the work of your hands and the unity of your pocketbook with others has caused you to build. Like a man that built a skyscraper and he walks downtown and he pats his belly and he looks up and says, ah, look what I have done. He had the pursuit of happiness to fulfill his desires. A few of us have done good but don't get it twisted. A few of us doing good has not benefited the masses of our people. So if what we have done has not helped the masses to move in a proper direction, what you've done is for you. What you've done may be for your family, but your family is a family among tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of families that are not doing well. So America, you, you started off with nice words. I mean, I mean, America can't beat the words of the Constitution and the preamble to it. Oh man, that's good stuff. But there's a problem. See, when you have good words, you got to have a good heart to give life to good words. Otherwise, it's what the president calls BS. And so many of us are full of BS that we can always force our mouth to say big things, but we can't force our hands to do good works. So the pursuit of happiness is the blessing of freedom, justice, and equality. Do we have freedom, a full, complete freedom? Do we have equal justice under the law? Do we have equality of opportunity? So the unraveling started from a lie. Because when it said, we the people, no women were involved in that. Uh-oh. Now I want you to talk to me. When the Federalist Papers were argued, there wasn't no woman in the room. We the people. But you ain't people if you're a woman. Over a hundred years, a woman had to wait to vote. I'm talking about white women. So if we, the people, didn't really include white women, and you know it never included black men and women, brown men and women, so you've been here, <clears throat> bless your hearts, 
trying to fit in. Well, let's look at what America's promise has been to us. You already know, I, I don't need to re rehearse that, but I want to show you the great seal of America. I uh, asked my team to don't fall asleep back there. I want you to show the original seal of this nation. It had on its face, oh, thank you, seal of the United States of America. Look at it. It was a coat of arms of six white European nations that made up this new nation. England, Scotland, Ireland, France, Germany, and Holland. It has the initials of the 13 colonies and it depicts a woman holding the scales of justice and the U.S. motto in Latin, E pluribus udum, out of many, one. You learned that in your civics class, but even though the country was populated by the native people, black slaves, the official seal of the country was never deny, designed to reflect our presence, only that of European immigrants. But look at the back of the seal. Show the back of that first original seal. There it is. The design reveals the spiritual blindness inherent in the origin of the United States. The founding fathers upheld obedience to God as their symbol while practicing genocide, colonialism, and slavery. We are tied up in every part of the history of this nation. We are in it, our presence is a part of it, and it kept them arguing with each other over the big question that remains today. What to do with the black, the brown, the non-white? It was Thomas Jefferson who helped design the seal. And while he was designing it, I want you to look at what he said. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. So let's go back to that seal, uh, brother. They got a strange thing in the air. with a light and fire in it and the light is shining down on Moses. You see Moses with his hand stretched out. Pharaoh in a chariot with a sword in his hand because after Pharaoh decided to let the children go, he changed his mind and he picked up a sword and was coming to kill all of them. And so this picture of what was above their heads that I will explain to you today, inshallah, they knew judgment was coming to America. 
I want you to hear me. The founding fathers knew that one day they would have to pay for what they did to the Native Americans, to the slaves, to all of the people that they have made poor and destitute, robbing them of their resources. Oh, yeah. God has never favored the undertakings of slavery, genocide, and colonialism. And look at the words of Jesus. One comes at the end, and he uses the pronoun I. He didn't say we. He said, I. will set up a new heaven and a new earth and the former things will pass away. All of this is to go at the end of the time of the rule of the Caucasian God comes to set up a new government, a new people. Behold, I make all things new. There'll be a new heaven. a new earth. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that the new heaven means a new spiritual power. And the new earth is a new political power. Because if heaven and earth don't work together, the earth suffers. If the rain stops, if the clouds don't come over the earth, the earth dies. When you got government and all you can do as a member of Congress is say a weak prayer to open the Senate and the House of Representatives, but there's no real connection to God. Yet you say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And you go on to say, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My mother said to me when I was going to school as a youngster, she said with her beautiful West Indian accent, she said, Jean, I don't want you to say these words like they give it to you, you know. I want you to say with liberty and justice for white people. So I never said the Pledge of Allegiance the way it's written. When I got to that part, I said for liberty and justice for white. But is that right? Then tell me. Why do you want to get into something that is coming to an end? You are fighting to vote. You are so upset over Mr. Trump.
You are so desperate to have that man out of the White House. You don't care who wins as long as Trump loses. So they put another billionaire in the fight. They don't give a skip about black people. He got a lot of money and he's paying off preachers. Now, 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 Reverend, Reverend, Reverend. Damn it. See, we got to stop playing the role of a whore. I mean, you know, God loves the prostitutes, but not whores that are politicians. The prostitute out there, God wants to clean her up. He wants to clean up the politics too. But when they can corrupt you, give you a bribe, give you something to satisfy your corrupt desires, then you sell out your people. And when you sell out your people for the bribe money, now they've got you. And when they got you, they start asking you to do things that you may not want to do, but now they got you with a few dollars. They bought you. So Jesus, not the Jesus the prophet, I'm gonna get into that in a minute, but Jesus the Messiah. You say, well, Jesus the prophet is not Jesus the Messiah? No. Jesus the Messiah says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. What black people need today are good shepherds. Black people need leaders that can't be bought. Black people need leaders who are not quick to jump into bed with strange women or strange men. Black people need leaders who can be a good example of righteous moral conduct. I, I hear you. My sister say, you better bring it. Yes, yeah, sister, I'm going to bring it for sure. That's my sister from Detroit, man. A fighter for real. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. But look here. Did you know that in 1877, they sold out the blacks of America? Just give me a couple of minutes with this. At the Wormley Hotel, it used to be in Washington. In 1877, during the election of Tilden and uh, Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, there was so much controversy because the slaves had been quote unquote 
set free. And Lincoln did this to ruin the South. But he didn't care whether we were free or slave. So don't let white folks tell you that uh, honest Abe Yeah, he was honest. He told you to get up and get the hell out of here. Now that was real honest. He said, we suffer from your presence. And you suffer from being present with us. He told the truth. He had some Negroes in the White House. You know how they do when they want to put something over? They get some Negroes. Come, come. And they get in the White House and they pass out cigars. You know, you, you politicians that, that like to, you know, you know what you do. <laughs> and when you sit down with your cigar and smoke the little stuff, then they tell you what they want you to do. A. Philip Randolph met and Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the great champion of so-called justice for black people. And A. Philip Randolph and the black leaders laid out the plight of black people. Franklin Delano Roosevelt handed out cigars. And as they were puffing and lighting it up, he said, now, Randolph, you spoke right. Now you have to go out and make me do it. In other words, I ain't going out on a limb with them cracker brothers of mine in Congress. You got to make me do it by going out among the people and stirring the people to your cause. So my beloved brothers, they met in the Wormley Hotel in Washington. Samuel Tilden was a Democrat, I think and Rutherford B. Hayes was the Republican, and they made a deal over you. It mimicked the first deal that they made when they started gathering the numbers for Congress in the states. The southern states wanted to use the number of the slaves to get more representation in the Congress. So the whites in the North argue. Oh man, that ain't right. All right, all right. I'll tell you what. We'll call the Negroes three-fifths of a human being. And uh, We'll let it go at that. Now think about it. I see school teachers in front of me. I don't know what the hell you teaching. But if you can't teach the truth, what good is being a teacher in this crap? If you can't tell the truth, if you're a part of feeding your people, the lies that America teaches to justify her evil to the native people, to people of color here and all over the world, then don't have a job like that. Don't let people poison you with money to make you poison your babies with lies. They sat down in Washington and the agreement was, if the Republican got in the White House, the Democrats agreed that they would 
take the federal troops that were in the South guarding black people. They would take them out of the South. And the deal was made on the date that was the birthday of Master Fard Muhammad. You really need a savior, black people. No, 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 no. Don't tell me Jesus saves. I know that. But you don't know that Jesus. That's your problem. The white man that you have on a cross is not Jesus. He's not even a reasonable facsimile. He comes out of the mind of Michelangelo. Now, brothers, sisters, you need a Jesus. There's no, no question. But that one, what, what did he do for you? I'm going to tell you something about Jesus, and then I'm going to introduce you. See, once that deal was made, there was a Jewish man by the name of Levy, William Levy, who argued in the House of Representatives to accept the deal. He won. Congress accepted it. The federal troops came out of the South and all reconstruction came to an end. Then the Ku Klux Klan, the slave codes, all the wicked things that we suffered from the 1800s up to now. How in the heck could you want to be a part of something like this. Now, another deal was made when President Trump was to be impeached. Another brilliant Jewish man named Dershowitz came to Congress to the Senate and gave them one of the most magnificent covers for cowardice. Mr. Dershowitz, there he is, bless his heart. That's our brilliant lawyer. And he made it so that the Senate, only one of them, didn't follow suit. And they, I don't know where he is now. He's, uh, they've been whooping the hell out of him. Now, I'm going to close this part with Mr. Trump. Well, I've been going a little while. Well, I'm going to try and rush it, because... Thank you. Now, you know America's going to go to war. They killed Qasem Soleimani and America is so powerful, she has the right to define others. Here's Qasem Soleimani, 
I think we met him when we were in Iran. You did? I think so. No, we're not recruited. We were recruited by God to do the work of God, not the work of Iran or any other nation on this earth. I did not go to Iran to beg for a dollar. In fact, we spent $114,000 going there. And I told them, keep it as a Savior's Day gift. Because I didn't come here to take your money or accept your hospitality. I came to give you a message. Do you want to know what the message was? See, you need leaders with courage. You need leaders whose te testicles are so heavy you got to put them in a wheelbarrow as they walk. Here's what I said to the supreme leader, the head of all Shia Muslims. I was given time to speak in a meeting of about 500 people, ayatollahs, generals, and others. Iran is a great nation. Iran is a nation and by the way, people made mockery of my name, Farcon. He said, that ain't no real name, you know what I mean? It may not be real to you, but everybody in the world that knows that name and knows the man who wears that name has honor and respect for that name and the man that wears that name. And, and some of you Muslims have given up the name of Elijah Muhammad. I feel sorry for you. Because the early Muslims suffered under that name Muhammad that we give everybody that wears the name Muhammad the right to wear it because the Muhammad family suffered and caught hell in America to wear the name Muhammad. Now some of, I got a son, he's here. He plays basketball. He was a star in his high school, along with Derrick Rose when they were playing ball in Chicago. And we all thought for sure he would make it to the NBA because he had that kind of talent. Only thing wrong with him he had a name that white folks are terrified over. Now, you know, if, if it was the name of a vampire, <laughs> a 
somebody just get on your neck and suck your blood. I, I can understand you not wanting to wear such a name. But my grandson went to a respected college on a four-year scholarship and was betrayed by the black coach that they had trust in. Sit him on the bench. Don't play him. And in a year or so, he lost his job. And a white coach came, Mr. Tony Bennett of the University of Virginia. And he gave my grandson a chance to play. He became captain, co-captain of his team. And when he left college, they let him play in the D League. But he suffered everywhere he went. Because he was good, man, but they, you know, the devil is like this. Did you see that dunk by Farrakhan? Yeah. He did it again. 20 points, 30 points, Farrakhan. Farrakhan, Farrakhan, Farrakhan. Say, damn, we don't want to say that name no more. on the front of a magazine. He had to suffer rejection because of the name. All these black coaches, people run out on the court when I went, when Brother um, Ice Cube had the game in Chicago with what they call the, the Big Three. I just happened to go to the game. And the stars start coming out of the woodwork to see another star. When white folks saw the way they bowed to Farrakhan, it terrifies them. That's why they took me down off of Facebook and Instagram. I haven't done anything but tell the truth. But that's what they're afraid of. See, if I had a 45, if I had an AK-47 and an Uzi, Oh, they would have me. But I got something that they can't defeat. First of all, I got the Lord of the worlds and his Messiah back in me. Now, 
I think I should move quickly to tie this up. I thank Allah for my grandson. I thank Allah for my grandchildren. I thank Allah for my great-grandchildren. I thank Allah for some of my great-great-grandchildren that God had blessed me. You'll never get rid of Farrakhan. I don't give a skip what you think. We're going on into the hereafter with Muhammad and the Muhammad family. We paid a price. So I want to say to any of my children, you, you can give up the name if you want. But you know, people will not respect you. You give it up for a privilege that you think is a privilege to curry some favor somewhere for something that you may desire to better your life. But I am assured that my name will live. No. I am assured. that my name will live down through the generations. I am assured that when my name is mentioned, the salutation of peace will be offered to my name. And I was told by my teacher that I will rule from beyond the grave. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you why. See, you, if, if you're a coward, that's what I'm talking about. See, you walk with me if you want some money. So I got a little whore, you know. Because these people that believe in me Give me the hard-earned dollars that I could send your raggedy ass through college and you didn't have to pay a dime. Excuse me. So if you want to throw the name away, throw yourself away with it. My wife and I have suffered for that name. My children, all of them, have suffered because of that name. Ah, but look at them. Ah, but look at them! And guess what? When we got to Iran, we had some books it went through custom called Defending Farrakhan. When the custom saw it, he said, that's our name. You didn't hear me. He said, that's our name. They had to learn to respect the man that has it because I made the name great by the power of God. And while I was in Iran, I saw where 
Persia began in the southeastern part of Iran, Farrakhan village. So when I went to Iran, I was at home. I saw Sharif Boulevard. I said, damn. I saw Ali Road. I saw all these names. I said, but Farcon. So now they had to test me. You got that name? And then I scolded them. I said, why you change your name to Iran? I said, I like Persia better. You said that? See, see, see when you know God, there's no king that you need to bow to. I bowed to my king because he's the king of kings. I bowed to my Lord because he's the Lord of lords. I bowed to my God because there is no God but him. So who the hell do I need to bow to after that? So I noticed them running to bow to me. Kiss my hand. Put their head on my shoulder. See, if you could see the honor that comes to me for standing up for Elijah Muhammad. What the hell do you look like being born under that name? and won't stand up for the man and the woman, Mother Clara Muhammad, and all of them that suffered for that name. It's real. So, Mr. Trump killed my brother, Qasem Soleimani. Mrs. Clinton killed my other brother, Muammar Gaddafi. That's why I couldn't support Ms. Clinton. And some of my little black friends angry with me because I, I, I wasn't going to vote for Miss Clinton. And I didn't support her. I was in Detroit, right here, and spoke some very kind words. Not about her. And she lost. I didn't know I had that much juice, you know. But <laughs> put Qasem Soleimani up. Now, Mr. Trump, this part of my lecture is talking to you. See, Mr. Trump, I respect you because you're the president of the United States of America. And you said that my brother is a terrorist. And you got the power to define people. So you may not like me, so you might call me a terrorist tomorrow to justify what the government is planning to do to me and the nation of Islam. But I, I, I'm just inviting you. 
No, 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 no. I'm inviting you to sit down and talk because I have a message for you from God. In fact, I'll give it to you today. Let me tell you something, brothers. Quran asked a question, do you wonder that a man born from among you has been selected by God to be a messenger of his to the people and a warner to the world and the nations? Yeah, that's who I am. You may know me as Louis Farrakhan. I didn't know what I was going to become as a student of Elijah Muhammad. But I like to tell you what my assignment is. See, Cousin, President Trump said, killed a lot of Americans. He's a bad man, so I killed him. He's bad. Where were the men that he killed? Did he kill him in New York? Did he kill him in Philly? Did he kill him in Colorado or California or Florida? Where did he kill them? He killed them in Iraq. What the hell were you doing in Iraq? Who called for you to come there? No, you got to listen, man. Mr. Trump said Bush should be impeached. Why? Because he lied to the American people saying that Iraq was making weapons of mass destruction. So the troops went. Did they find any weapons? How many Iraqis did American soldiers kill? Tens of thousands. How many Americans lost their lives? Thousands. Because you sent them there. Obama sent them there. young white children who joined the armed forces to defend this country. And you sent them to die because of your lust for oil, for the treasures of other nations. That man was no terrorist. He was killing members of an occupying army on the territory of Iraq. And he, as the brother of them from Iran, was trying to rid them of an occupying army. Now, I'm naming you. And I got weight with God. an occupying army what are you doing in the middle east soldiers everywhere who sent for them protecting your little flunky nations So now if I speak like I speak, and you know I'm telling the truth, this is not hyperbole, truthful hyperbole. This is the real actual facts. You went there not to save the Iraqi people. You went there and spent trillion dollars to make Iraq a bulk walk 
of defense against Iran. I heard Rumsfeld when they said from Iraq they wanted to have a government like Iran. Iran is a theocracy that rules from God's perspective. You don't know nothing about that. What do you go to church for? Any of you Christians, what do you go to church for if you don't want to live under God's rule and God's law and then say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What do you think the kingdom of God is? It's God ruling. You don't have to vote for him. He has already come to take over the rule. So if you want to live in the kingdom, not the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of God, that's a government under the rules and laws of God. Iran is trying to do that. So when I spoke to the Supreme Leader, I said, you're looking for the Mahdi. This whole nation of 90 million people is born and are willing to die serving the Mahdi. I said, you are looking for the Mahdi, but the Mahdi came to us. And I am here representing him. Did you hear what I said? I told him what the Mahdi told Elijah. America's number one on his list to be destroyed. He don't like you for your evil, but there's a way out for you. The Mahdi speaks 16 different languages, wrote 10. The Mahdi pictured and extracted the language of the people on Mars. The Mahdi spoke the language of the birds. The Mahdi visited every inhabited part of the earth. The Mahdi came among us and raised Elijah Muhammad as his messenger messiah listen 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 he pointed out an object in the sky a half a mile by a half a mile the greatest mechanical object ever made having 50 1,500 little wheels or bombing planes. He can take America out in 12 hours. I'm not representing no fantasy God. I'm not representing no spook God. It's hiding somewhere in the sky. I represent the most high God who sits in that wheel that Ezekiel saw. A wheel in the middle of a wheel. And I visited that wheel. He 
He brought me to that wheel like Allah brought Muhammad in a night vision to the inner sanctum of himself. He brought me there though I yet was here. He gave me a message. He told me that the president was planning a war. And I want you to have a press conference and tell them his plans and tell them that you got it from me, Elijah Muhammad on the wheel. I never failed to deliver that message. They hated me for it. They lied on me because of it. They made mockery. So when I made the announcement, I told them that before you can make mockery of me, you'll see the wheels. Yeah. Yes. And they flew over the White House and flew over the Congress. Yeah. Damn it, I'm not no spook believer. I'm not no man that believe in fantasy. I know what I experience, and I'm not a liar. I put my life on what I say. He told me, Elijah Muhammad spoke to me, and he told me the plan of Ronald Reagan. And what I learned by looking deeper into his words, he told me the plan of six presidents of the United States culminating in the one that's in the White House now. Yeah, culminates. I said, this is the end of the drama. Like Paul, I boast in God. I don't boast in me because I'm nothing without God. But he made me. He made me the, as a helper to the man that he made. Yes. And he made me to stand with Elijah like Aaron stood with Moses as another prophet with Moses. Mr. Trump, you are written of in the scriptures in many places. I am too. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, once had a heart like a human being. And God took out of him the heart of a man and gave him the heart of a beast. See, Mr. Trump, when you were running for the office, you talked about going into Iraq and taking the oil. See, that's thug talk. That's the talk of a beast. See, beasts eat when they're hungry. They don't ask permission to kill their prey. That's their nature. 
So the Bible talks about four great beasts. See, brothers and sisters, you really need to understand what you've been preaching and what you've been reading and what you've been believing. Because the power is not in preaching. The power is in doing what you are preaching. Listen, listen. My dear brothers and sisters, we're at the end of it all. I know that the enemy wants me dead. I hear them on social media when my name is trending. They say, oh, Farrakhan must be dead. So they start tuning in and they hear me teaching. Damn it, that Negro ain't dead yet. Why don't somebody, listen, why don't somebody kill him? Well, you're somebody, aren't you? Why don't you try? These are master assassinators. And I have to say to my president, Mr. President, please be careful because you're upsetting a lot of people. You may win the election because the Democrats will at last put their hope in a billionaire because Mr. Biden can't handle it. What will you do if he gets a second term? What will you do? See? The hatred is building for him because God allowed him to be president. Don't you think that God is interested in who sits in the White House that holds sway over his people that he has chosen to be his people? Let me just tie this up. See, all of us have made an agreement with hell. All of us have made a covenant with death. The pale horse of the revelation had a rider that was death and hell followed closely behind. Everywhere the pale horse has ridden, death has come. Everywhere the white man has put his foot down on our planet. Death and hell followed. Mr. Trump, please, you mentioned in some of your writings not to denigrate those who are under your leadership, but you have nicknames for everybody and You've said some rough things to your generals. Please, Mr. President. This is a country that kills presidents. It'll be the worst mistake that anyone makes to try to kill the president of the United States. He has a work to do. That's right. Does he? What kind of work does God have for him to do? He's doing it. Isn't this the government that's been giving us hell ever since we've been in America? 
come on and talk to me. Has the FBI been our friend? Well, has he attacked the FBI? Then shut up! They're getting what they deserve. Has the IRS been our friend or our enemy? Has he attacked the IRS? Has the intelligence of America been the friend of the poor? Who told Colin Powell to go before the United Nations and sell the lie that Iraq was making weapons of mass destruction? It was the intelligence community. They run presidents with intelligence books. So Trump has his own way of getting information. In every embassy in the world, there's a desk for the CIA. CIA is a criminal arm of the government. Let me say it again. I know I gotta pay a price for what I'm saying. I'm willing to pay that price. But I hope those that come are willing to pay a price. Do you know how valuable I am? No, you don't. No, you don't know. No, you don't know. See, what value does God put on my life? How do you know? See, God loves me. They've tried to kill me several times. And they admit that there must be a hedge around me. Because why isn't he dead? Is a man standing here for two hours with two torn meniscuses in my knee? Ah, damn. And you, you thought that I couldn't stand for two hours? You thought I might fade away? Listen to the strength of my voice? Listen to the passion and the power of my faith? And know that I am empowered like that which empowers the sun itself? For I am your light the light of a new world. So Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, is a scripture that says that Nebuchadnezzar began growing a newer kind of heart. He was coming back toward humanity. I don't know which Nebuchadnezzar I'm talking to, but suppose I'm talking to the Nebuchadnezzar who's becoming a human being again with human feelings and compassion. Suppose I'm talking to that Nebuchadnezzar. My teacher told me before he left, he said, brother, you got to do more than teach that Jonah went to Nineveh. 
Imagine your teacher talking to you like that. And as dumb as I was and am, I didn't know what he was saying. But here's what he's telling me, Mr. Trump. See, Jonah was a reluctant prophet. Jonah didn't want to preach. He was running from his assignment. But he ran into God. He had to decide, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So, Mr. Trump, see, Jonah came to the king. And since you're playing that role, I can come to you like Jonah came to the king of Nineveh. America, Mr. President, needs to repent for what you've done and what you continue to do to the peoples of the world. You have 10 commandments, 10 beautiful commandments that America does not follow. The 10th commandment is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's ox, thy neighbor's donkey. Whatever the donkey or whatever the man has, you should not desire it. See, you covet the wealth that's in the Middle East. That's why your armies are there. You covet the wealth of Africa. That's why you're now moving on Africa. See, you want what others have been given by God, but you don't want to bargain with them honestly and give them wealth for wealth that they may be able to build up their own countries. So you find a way to meddle in the affairs of the nations of the earth, then blame them for meddling in your election. Mr. Trump, America has interfered in the uh, elections of 81 nations. Mr. Trump, wasn't it your government that went down to uh, Venezuela? You don't like Maduro? What did Maduro do? He's got oil down there too. So you go and choose. He's a handsome young man, but he wasn't elected by the people. You elected him, Mr. Trump, and you got nations bowing to your will. Yes, you do. So they all sided with you that this man is the president, but you can't install him. You're embarrassed because he's still there, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'm asking you to repent on behalf of the wickedness of your people, white people for the evil that you have done to self, to others, to us, to the native people, to the indigenous. Wickedness is what's making America suffer. Have you seen the weather? You know the weather is against you. It ain't, listen, listen, listen. All of you could get together and try to stop what you call climate control. Climate is not being controlled by you. Climate is being controlled by the God who is here in control of the climate. So when I tell you to watch the weather, he goes to work and shows you.
It's real talk. I am the man of God today. You can either take it or let it alone. I will not beg you, but I will tell you that the God wants to separate you from your enemies. God wants to give you a land. What? Where are we going? Could be right here. If, God, if Trump realizes that the penalty for rejection is the death of the nation, Let's make a deal. You know the art of the deal. Move out and let us move in. You don't have to blow nothing up because we helped you build everything you got. Just move out, let us in. We need uh, several hundred million acres. You can carve it out for us if it means death for you if you don't. See, God is not playing. See, you are his people. I know you don't believe it. Oh, but you will. Your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with hell will not stand. Now, Mr. Trump, America is the modern Babylon. I want to have a message for the Jewish people. I'm not a hater. You can't find one word in the millions of words that I've spoken where I ordered somebody to hurt a Jewish person. No, that's not me. But to tell the truth, I'm going to put a little truth on you today and then I'm going to close it out. You've been such a beautiful, attentive audience. Now, look at the scripture. Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. Substitute America for Babylon. She's unraveling. America is falling. Is falling. Why are you falling, America? Because you have become the habitation of devils. A hole for every foul person. A cage for every hateful bird. Have you become a nation of devils? No, 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 no. Oh, you got to think now. Who am I talking to? Is it people that love righteousness? Or is it a people that can't wait for me to end what I'm saying so you could get back to the filth that you were doing before you got here? I talking to Mr. Trump this country has become a habitation of devils everybody rebelling against God look at the Ten Commandments put them back up so I can help the people to see how wrong America is 
I'm almost finished, family. But please, please. Oh, now you got it. Now look, you shall have no other gods but me. Stop it. You can stop right there. Or you make gods out of everything and bow down to it. Tell me the truth. You shall not make for yourself any idol nor bow down to it or worship it. Oh, 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 oh. How many idols do you genuflect to? How many idols are in the church? Your holiness. How many idols have you made that people bow down to and worship the idol as though the idol has power? Come on. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Well, we can move on. You shall remember and keep the Sabbath day holy. That used to be. What are you doing? What are you doing Sunday? I'm at the casino. That's what I'm doing. I'm watching the football game, baby. That's what I'm doing. Your party ain't keeping the day holy. Respect your father and mother. Yeah, go get them out of the old age home. The minute your mama can't do for you anymore, you park her somewhere and don't give a damn about how mama's being treated. The same mother that brought you through fainting and pain into this world and cleaned your diapers and washed you. Now you can't go and wash mama in the and daddy in the closing days of their lives. What kind of children have you become? What kind of people have we become? Oh, Mr. Trump, you shall not commit murder. You took credit. Oh, yeah, I had the boys kill Qasem Olmani. You sent the drone after him. How many have you killed? How many are you planning to kill? See, murder is your modus operandi. See, here I am now. You want me dead. And after today, you might want to speed it up. I don't know. But Mr. Trump, America has become a habitation of devils and a hole for every unclean spirit and a cage for every hateful bird. Hateful birds mean those that are in foreign countries. You in Wuhan province, I didn't know you were there. Now you got a little something that you want to bring home to America. Ain't that something? You're everywhere. And as things change, yeah, I'm, I'm about to finish, son. Got it, partner. <laughs> this house of devils. Man, I have my brother. I'm not going to make it personal. We're trying to make our children respect their own sexuality. I'm not talking about the sexuality that's created by Satan and his manipulation of biology and chemistry. I'm talking about what God gave us. You don't want to be a man anymore. And some of you don't want to be a woman anymore. Just look at yourself. Men coming to men. 
with lust. Like you should react to a female, you see a handsome man. See, I get afraid to walk the street, man. This is like Sodom and Gomorrah, man. Hey, Farrakhan, how you doing? You so fine, brother. And he don't know that the angels have come to kill them all, but they still wanted life. Lot trying to offer his daughter, hey, look, I got two beautiful daughters. Hey, I don't want your daughter. We want you. And this didn't start in Africa. African people don't know nothing about that kind of way of life. Now America's using quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, if you take this money, you got to pass laws for same-sex marriage. America, you've become a real Satan. You are encouraging <coughs> rebellion against God. Now, to my homosexual, gay, and transgender, and queer and family. You know, Jesus that I represent, he really loves you. He didn't come here to condemn you for the sins that you've learned by your sojourn with the head of freaks. Why does the devil keep us apart from his social equality? Because he does not want us to know how filthy he is and all his affairs. Lest when we find out about him, we will drive him from among us. That man used to keep us away from his social equality. Now when you get a song and a hit, you play good ball, you knock the ball over the fence, you run faster than anybody else. Hey, hey, come in now. I'm going to a party, you wanna come with me? What kind of party is it when you'll find out when you get there? And the next thing you know, you become a booty. Jeez. You must not commit murder. You're a murderer and you've been that all your life. You must not commit adultery. Stop it. You must not steal. You steal every day of your life. You must not give false evidence against your neighbor. You a big liar on everybody. You must not be envious of your neighbor, covetous of his house, nor his wife, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's why you're in everybody's country. You are over there with your army. You're over there with your military. Mr. Trump, it's time for America to repent. And I tell you what, if you repent and accept the proposition of God, he don't want you trying to integrate into madness. He wants you to consider separation in a land of your own, setting up your own government, growing your own food, creating industry for yourself, starting with economic trade and investment. And now, as I close,
The Bible says that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, Paul says, turn away. In closing, it might take me a couple of minutes to get. I want to mention my brother Kobe. I can't let this go. I wanted to talk about Kobe and I wanted to give some joy to those who knew him for the life that he lived in front of us that touched our lives. I want to take away with God's help some of the hurt and pain of it. our tragic loss of him. But God, by taking his life in the way that it happened, has stopped the world of sport and play with one death. It affected the whole world. but it affected the whole world of sport and play. I and my family were in Sedona, Arizona, where my daughter, BJ, was vacationing with her husband. And we usually go up, as she goes up every year, for a two week vacation and one day out of her two weeks, we visit her. Other members of the family and the laborers that are present with me in the messenger's home in Phoenix, Arizona, we all would go to Sedona. So my daughter had arranged on that Sunday morning when we were about to leave for us to be at a fabulous restaurant with a view that was just magnificent. There were 17 of us. And the news came while we were sitting in the restaurant. It came by a telephone call to Brother Haroon. And he spread it to those of us at the table that Kobe had passed. The table had gasped. I don't know what my immediate reaction was, but I was very quiet, not emotional, and my mind went immediately to Allah. Because we do not consult him enough when things happen in our lives and in the lives of others to help us understand more 
of the will of God. So while sitting at the table, I would not speak. My mind was on Allah and I was throwing scriptures around in my mind to comfort myself in the knowledge of our great loss of our brother. But you know, when you go to God, you go to the only being that has the right answer for your question. I have been thinking seriously recently about life, your life, my life, our lives. We do not consider enough that God, Allah, is the sovereign Lord of our very being and our lives are his to use as he pleases for his purposes. We don't think like that. So we focus on the sadness of the tragedy. And then, of course, when I learned that his daughter was with him, it compounded the pain. But it also compounded my question to God. For he says in the Quran, no soul dies, but with his permission. It may be an accident on one level, but it is purposeful on another level of the sovereign Lord of everybody in the helicopter and everybody on the ground and all the people that would be affected by God's will. So as I was thinking on God and thinking on belief in one moment, you're a believer in God. And then a situation takes place in your life that is a misfortune, and the misfortune hits us so hard that in the next moment we have moved from the column of a believer into the column of doubt. And then anger comes up with God because he's the ultimate source of life and death. And then we go to the other column and we become an instant disbeliever. And throughout our lives, we keep moving back and forth from belief to doubt to unbelief, to anger with God, then believing in him again. We're so much like the fickle nature of the public. They are with you in this instance and they are against you in the next instance. So I wanted to understand that. So when we said goodbye, to BJ and Maurice to come back to Phoenix and they wanted to drive to the highway with us. We were in several cars and I said to my daughter, Colliday, have you ever heard of the chapel in Sedona in the beautiful red rocks? It's made out of a rock, but it's a huge cross. I said to my family, and they re re radioed it to the other cars, the minister wants to stop at the chapel because I felt a need to pray. There are certain things that happen in your life that you might not have an answer to, but it brings you to your knees. And there's no one else to consult but God. So 
we drove to the chapel, a beautiful chapel, a Catholic chapel. But when you want to talk to God, any house where his name is remembered is a good house to visit. It's a Catholic chapel. I later learned that Kobe went to the little chapel that morning and took communion. Father Steve Salad of Our Lady, Queens of Angels in Newport Beach told KABC that Kobe 46, 1 and Gianna 13 received communion for heading off for their helicopter ride. As I went in the church, the chapel, because I've been suffering from two meniscus tears and my legs are not as stable as I would like them to be, so two brothers are always by my side because sometimes my legs just collapse and I fall and so far I've fallen a few times when the brothers were not with me but most of the time when it happens I don't ever hit the ground because the brothers are there. When I got to the chapel, I was in my wheelchair and they wheeled me down to the front of the chapel where all the candles are. And I saw where I wanted to kneel down to say my prayer and my brother, Nadir said, don't, don't do that because it would hurt your knee. So I sat on the bench and called my son Mustafa to my side. I bowed my head and cupped my hand in the position of a dua or the asking of something from God. And I began to pray for Kobe. <clears throat> I was thanking God for the joy that he gave to so many of us who watched him play. And then I began to pray for the people on the helicopter who evidently were his friends and companions who traveled with him not knowing that they would die with the one whom they loved and was traveling with. And as I was bearing witness to the greatness of God, I, I just broke down. I didn't cry out, but tears fell from my eyes that were bigger than tears that I've seen before from myself and the tear rolled down my right cheek and I watched it fall to the ground, or not the ground, but the floor of the church. And it looked like a huge teardrop. I didn't know that my daughter was filming me and the prayer that I was saying, though my prayer was not loud. But when I opened my eyes, she was there. So some of my words are there for whatever purpose they may serve. And then I looked up and there was the crucifix with Jesus on it. And I had not seen it until I finished my prayer and looked up 
And I said, Donna, get the picture because the Jesus Christ that was in terrible agony on that cross was black. It was bronze but burnished so it looked black and I said father you know I'm looking I know at myself and I'm looking at you all friends of mine that may be with me in some circumstance where death hovers and I found out after getting back to Mr. Muhammad's home in Phoenix, where I'm blessed to live, that my brother Khalil, who works with Layla Ali on occasion, was in California with Layla and her husband on some assignment. And he said to me, may I show you something? I said, certainly. In back of the house where Layla and her family lives, it's in the valley where the plane went down. And they could see the smoke from the burning of the helicopter. But in the evening, the wheel showed up. There was a full moon that was on a level like it was just above the horizon, but the star was up above the moon. And I said to God, Father, I understand. Because when Kobe died, I knew there was a message in it for me and for us. And I'm going to explain the meaning of the message. Beloved, and I want to ask my team to take the, uh, the uh, picture of the wheel and I want you to put it up on the screen. It's on page 49 of this document. You have it up? Do you see it? You see the moon? Up above it is not a star. You can't find any stars in the sky. The presence of the wheel was there. And Layla's husband said to Brother Khalil, he said, I believe that God was in that star. When he showed it to me, I didn't say anything to him. But I said to Allah, now I understand why you took my brother in the way you did and the lesson that is in his death for us all. Now, God wanted us to focus on Kobe. I want you to keep this up on the uh, screen because I'm coming to it. God wanted us to focus on Kobe because there was something in his development that God wanted not only basketball and sports enthusiasts to study, he wanted us who love sports and love the sacrifice that great sports idols put into their craft. He wanted us to see the sacrifice of Kobe as a teenager coming into the league directly from high school with a commitment to basketball and to himself. As a player, he never took his talent for granted like some who are gifted and the gift is so superior they don't fight with themselves to improve themselves 
though they may not have any competition outside of themselves to match what they do and do it bigger and better. That's the kind of lesson that is in Kobe's life for us to study. Kobe dedicated his life to his craft. He would always be in the gym practicing. He was good at what he did. He was so good he scored 81 points in one game and shocked the basketball world because in order to make 81 points in one game the mathematics that he had to master to maneuver himself in and around the opposition to him to get to his sweet spot where he could put the ball in the basket. And any time that a man can make 81 points in a game, that's mathematics on a level that you have not seen among the common player. Which brings me to this. The Quran, which is the book of scripture of Muslims, and I would hope that everyone who listens to me today, though I know you have a Bible, you must try to get a holy Quran and bring it to your home and start reading it. The language may be strange at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's the most beautiful book that you could ever read or study. Now, The Quran says, in everything that Allah created, there is a lesson for man if man would be mindful. You and I were born into the most magnificent treasure. If you're a student, and you find yourself in the greatest library in the world, you're like not a child at, what's the name of that place that children like to go? Yeah, Disney World, you know. You are in heaven. Now imagine yourself being born and everywhere you look, Everything that God created has a treasure for you if you would study it. Now I'm saying that because God wanted us to focus on Kobe. What treasure did he put in Kobe for all of us? So while today, tomorrow, he will be memorialized, I want us to think about ourselves because each one of us is a creation of God in which he's deposited a gift and a treasure. Are you listening? You have not yet discovered your gift. And if you have, the duty that you have is to exploit your gift. 
evaluate its value and use it to help others for the glory of God. Now, here's the lesson that you will find in Kobe. If you want to be great in any field of human endeavor, you must be willing to make a sacrifice. Kobe came out of high school and was drafted immediately into the NBA. He was playing with the big boys from day one. So he wanted to not only play with the big boys, he wanted to be one of them. Meaning that each of us have something in us that we have a duty to develop. This is why you must respect each other and in respecting each other, you are respecting God because God is the creator of everyone that you see. And God is the giver of gifts to everyone that he created. So if you don't know how to respect God, you'll never plumb the depth of your own gift nor will you see the gift that is in others that you admire as a reflection of the gift that is sitting up inside of you. So now, look at the way he took Kobe. See, if Kobe had laid down in a bed, got sick, and we heard on the news that he was sick and then passed away, then, you know, it's not like the way he took Kobe. See, it was so sudden. It was such a shock. God wanted it that way because he wanted Kobe's life to be more than a basketball because Kobe was more than a basketball player. He wanted us to see the greatness of Kobe as a businessman. Why? Because all those who are in basketball, in sports, making money, money becomes an enemy because you don't know what to do with it. And then when you get fame, it kills you because you don't know how to handle it. Kobe knows how to use his money. And Kobe was not bothered by his fame. Kobe became a spiritual giant. He analyzed what he did in life and he talked about paying it forward, doing something that the next generation would benefit. That's the Kobe that God wanted us all to meet because that's what's in each and every one of us. Put Kobe up in a constellation of stars. Now look, do you see it? Kobe's a star, a star of piercing brightness. But look at the stars that surround this star. Up at the top is Kareem 
Abdul Jabbar, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Will Chamberlain, LeBron James, Barkley, Moses Malone, Shaq, and Kareem. I saw my brother Shaq cry. I saw LeBron cry. I saw Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a Muslim, not understanding how to handle the, the will of God. And I asked God, would you allow me to know so that some of the pain of his loss that might cause them to lose faith in you, that I might be able to say words of comfort that this great life that you gave, you took back to yourself. So I ask this audience, the Bible says, the Lord giveth. Do you agree with that? And the Lord taketh away. So your life doesn't belong to you. He puts you on loan to the earth for a purpose. And you've got to discover what your purpose is and work it during the time of your life. You don't know how short or how long that time is going to be, but you can't waste time. You got to go to work and do something with your life that you may make a change. You understand what I'm saying? So I saw that as a lesson for me because I am also a star of piercing brightness. Put it up on the uh, screen, page 46. Do you have it? Now. Yeah. See, my teacher made me a star. But I found out that Master Far Muhammad made me. He told me, brother, I gave you the same thing that I gave everybody else, but only God could show you how to take the teaching and put it in the way that you do. Then he said, no, brother, I did not make you. God made you for me. So when you look at Moses, the modern Moses, as Elijah, that is the modern Aaron, the mouthpiece of Moses. If Malcolm had stayed in the class, he would have grown into that great stardom. Who do I hang out with? Abraham, Noah, Lot, Aaron, Elijah, Elisha. Muhammad, Joshua, 
Moses. Wouldn't you like to be in that constellation of stars? Now look, I'm not putting stardom on myself. I just belong in that company. You can doubt it. I mean, I don't care nothing about that. Now, let's go back to the picture of the moon and the wheel. We can stop now. Y'all all right. I know some of you getting tired. <laughs> you see, you can go to the bathroom, but I, I don't need to because I have a little something that I have for my condition. <laughs> oh, Lord. So I think I'll say it like this. Put that up. There it is. You see the moon? The moon, in spiritual language, represents the prophets of God. Because the moon has no light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. That is a full moon. It represents the fullness of the prophets and their prediction of the one that would come at the end of the world to answer the prophets predictions fulfilling all of the predictions of the prophets thus sealing them as the prophets of God. My teacher told me that in, uh, Master Farid Muhammad, he took his place by his permission. He said, I'm making you to take mine. So if he was Messiah while he was here, No, no, no. That's the hat that I wear today. Just listen. If I had said it 40 years ago, you would have said I was crazy. You still may say it, but I got 40 years of unequal work. And can't none of you match my work. None of you. God used me to call a million men to Washington and two million men show up. What man have you ever seen in America or in the world? Then if that demon in Washington, Hoover, was looking for a Messiah that could unite the nationalist community. Well, it was announced on February 16th, 1995, that the Messiah is in the world. October 16th. When Two million men or nearly two million showed up and everybody who was anybody was there. What drew you there? What drew you there? It was not I. It was a spirit bigger than I that called you to witness his Messiah. So I'll stop right there. Jesus is the key.
to everything. And to Muslims in the audience who say, well, wait a minute, Farrakhan, because you're supposed to be a Muslim. Yeah, I am that. Well, Muslims don't talk about Jesus. They talk about Muhammad. When I talk about Muhammad, I'm talking about Jesus. Because the Jesus that is to show up with the Mahdi, his name is Muhammad. Worthy of praise. Yeah. It's, it might blow your mind for a minute. I got a little time. I'll wait on you. I want you to I want you to do the scholarly work because the man that you are looking at is prepared to die to prove the faith listen to me good see Jesus knew that his life was to be taken but it had a higher purpose Kobe's life taken in an accident has a higher purpose because God wanted you to see him. But he was a sign of a man that you will see the enemy come to get me. That's right. And I laugh because the cross don't scare me. I feel like Jesus saying, God, are you sure that this is what you want me to do? And Jesus said, well, drink this cup, you know. It's bitter. See, everything looks nice now, don't it? See how beautiful you look? But I am to be betrayed. See, I don't know who the betrayer is. He's sitting up around me somewhere. Come on out, baby, and do your thing. And then go kill yourself afterwards. You may not like what I'm saying, But there came a time in the life of Jesus when he started telling people who he was. See? Who do the people say I am? I walked among my Christian family. Y'all used to call me a prophet. I ain't never told you to call me that. I'm not a prophet. See that star that's above the moon? I'm the master of prophets. By Allah's permission. See, there are some things that have to be fulfilled. All the prophets wanted to be here today to see this man do this work. They wanted to be a wayfarer somewhere looking at a man, raising dead people to life, opening the eyes of the blind, making the deaf hear and the dumb speak and the lame walk. You don't hang around me and stay blind. So how deep is your love, Farrakhan? So some of Kobe's friends went down on that plane. Their lives are sacred. Their lives are to be honored. We just can't talk about Kobe. You have to talk about 
Mr. and Mrs. Altabelli and their daughter. You have to talk about Sarah Chester and Peyton Chester and Christina Mousy and the pilot Hera Zubayan because they all were a part of what God did on that day for us all. Kobe becomes in posterity a leader for our eyes to follow. Those of you who play sports, those of you who have daughters, there's a picture of Kobe with his little daughter, Gianna, reaching up to Kobe. Look at that, look at that. Look at the love in his eyes and look at the love in her face. Every father that has a daughter, don't you want your daughters to love you? That had to be a good father. So Miss Gale, Miss Gale King, Miss Gale, you are my sister. I love you and I admire the good that you've done. But you were being used on that day to besmirch the memory of a good man, Gail. You were there to knock down my brother, she did a documentary on, what's his name? Who? R. Kelly. R. Kelly did some bad things. But there's some fathers in this audience that have raped their daughters. There's some fathers out there who misuse and abuse their granddaughters. Kobe did so much good in his life. Couldn't you find something, Gail? to say good about your brother, a fellow sufferer. Mr. Rose from CBS, he was charged with abusing women. You defended him. Sister Gail, my brother Snoop. No, wait, 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 wait. My brother Snoop was angry. Angry with you because what you did was so unnecessary. And so, <clears throat> I defend the good that Gail has done in her life. But I'm saying to all of you that are in privileged position with white people, don't let them use you. She gave an interview. My analyst told me 34% of her questions were probing questions to Lisa Leslie, and you kept coming back to the same theme, even though she defended her love for Kobe. 
couldn't you find in his 20 years of marriage that he was still married? Brought us four beautiful girls. Couldn't you find something to say about the daughter father love and the people telling him he needed a, a boy to carry on his legacy and, and there was Gianni becoming a basketball savant. Couldn't you find something to say that he championed the rights of women? So, Sister Gail, though I love you and I love Kobe and I love Snoop, I defend Snoop's anger. I defend Snoop's rebuke. And I defend Snoop's speech. Now, I don't approve of no man referring to any woman, black or white, with the title of B. At the Million Man March, all of you that were there, you took that pledge. But in his anger, I defend him from the Quran. For the Quran says when somebody feels hurt and they use hurtful speech, hurtful speech is justified when you hurt like you hurt. He was hurt and we are hurt. But I pray for you, Sister Gail. I pray that you will recover that lost sense of commitment to your people out of which you came. Your people who were made by the white man. On the back of their collar, you will see it, made in America. You can regain your place with us, but not by justifying what you did. Why don't you just repent and say, I'm sorry. As Snoop said it, he was sorry because mama got on him. My mama was right but God is also right. She did something that provoked hurtful speech for many more people than Snoop. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> Family, I tell you what. I think you have been so sweet, so lovely, so patient, so attentive. I cannot wear out your patience anymore. I have many more things to say, so <laughs> next week, tune in. I'll be at Mosque Mariam in Chicago. 
with my assistant minister. And we'll put it up on NOI.org so you can get part two. And it starts with Jesus is the key. So thank you. May Allah bless you. May Allah guide you. May Allah comfort you. May Allah bless you to get safely home to your places of abode. And may Allah protect our nation from the unraveling that we see of this great nation. And if we are as watchful of our constitution and the rules and laws that govern our nation. And if you as Muslims would make a stand tonight, today for righteousness. And if there's anything you're doing that you know Allah would not be pleased with, you can stop it. You don't need anything but the will to say, I'm going to stop. So I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> yes. Tell him to stop by the hotel and see me. Thank you, believers. Thank you. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, brothers and sisters, let's put our hands together for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Where you fed, where we fed, where we taught, where we inspired, where we enlightened, where we encouraged. Please don't move. Let's stop the movement and as they say in the church, be still. We got to thank God. We got to thank God for the message today and the man who brought us the message. So can you just, just, just stand still and let's thank the Lord for the message he gave us through his anointed servant. I want to thank before we say prayer once again, student minister Troy Muhammad. Brother Student, Minister Terry, where is our minister from Flint? All of our brothers and sisters from Flint, where are you in the house? Let me see your hands. Welcome Flint, Michigan. Our beautiful brothers, sisters, activists, and we wish the new mayor the best in his office. Our city in Flint and our residents have suffered much and I really had a great time in visiting Flint a few days ago. Thanks to the effort of Brother Terry from Flint, Michigan, our student minister. Brother Marcus from uh, Saginaw, Michigan. Our brother from Inkster, Michigan. Um, Linton. All of these brothers, Brother my namesake, Ishmael Muhammad, Lansing, Michigan, our mayor and minister of Benton Harbor. There he is, student minister, Marcus Muhammad. All of the student ministers of the state of Michigan and the great city of Detroit. Thank you, thank you, thank you for a wonderful Savior's Day. Now, let us bow our heads. Let us bow our heads. Let us bow our heads and thank 
the one God for this day, for each other, for his anointed servant. We pray in the Muslim prayer, the oft repeated prayer. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the world, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we worship thine aid we seek. O Allah, guide us on the right path the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom your wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard thy teachings. Say he, Allah is one. Allah is he on whom we all depend. He begets not nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness, there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I mean, please visit our vending. We also have the great bean pie the supreme bean pie for your enjoyment. Visit our cafe as well. I'm sure you have an appetite. And we also want to offer you Let's Change the World. This is the music album that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan developed with some of our most talented and gifted artists that are on this label. Please get this on your way out. And we also have the DVD of today's message available for you. And remember, tune in to NOI.org next Sunday, the live webcast from Chicago, Illinois, from Mosque Mariam, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's part two of this Savior's Day 2020 message. The subject next Sunday is Jesus is the key. Thank you, brothers and sisters. And remember, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. God bless you. Vending. Vending is in Hall E. Vending Hall E down the escalators. Support 